One thing I've been finding fascinating to cover here on the channel recently is how the cost of everything has increased. You know, we've been talking about the cost of fast food going up. The other day we talked about grocery prices going up. And today we're going to talk about cars because I think it's important for everybody to acknowledge and realize how much things have gone up because some people are out of touch. They don't uh, really pay attention to this stuff, especially if they make a lot of money. And, you know, you just don't see these every everyday price increases and it gives people the perception sometimes that things are a lot better than they are when in the real world economy practically nobody can afford this stuff and this is particularly true when it comes to cars both brand new and used and so I feel like this is going to be a new series on the channel here where you know we talk about the price of things when I come across information you know today's about cars if I come across something else in the future you guys want to send me something on how much certain things have gone up in price let me know and I'll be sure to cover it here on the channel but when it comes to cars, brand new car prices have risen by 30% since 2020 and used car prices have gone up by 38% since 2020. So no matter which way you slice it, if you need a car, it's gonna be a whole lot more expensive today than it would have been four years ago. Look at the average price now for new and used cars, guys. As of 2023, the average brand new car price is $50,364, while the average used car price is $31,030. Now used car prices have been coming down. They came down about 2% in the past year on average and new car prices have actually gone up 1% in the past year. And so many listings for cars are just completely unaffordable because when you look at it, it is just staggering guys. 10% of new car listings only are priced below $30,000. So it's almost impossible to buy a brand new car in America today for less than $30,000. And I used to work at a couple different car dealerships, but only one of them that sold brand new cars, guys. I remember back then, I was working there 2006, I think. Back then, there was half the cars on the lot, probably under $30,000, you know, all brand new. Today, you'd be lucky to find 10% of them. That's how much things have changed in the last 15, 20 years. And even with used cars, it doesn't really get much better, unfortunately, because with the used car market, only 28% of car listings right now are below $20,000. That's abysmal, guys. Like, that's still pretty high. That's a lot more expensive than a lot of people can afford. You know, most people, if they're looking to buy a used car, probably want to keep it under 10 grand for the most part. And so these used car prices are still at least double that in the cheapest category. You know, you're, you're not finding many cars priced in this price range, really. And here's where it all starts to fall apart for me. And I think for the average person here is that according to, uh, a report in October by Market Watch, Americans need an annual household income of at least $100,000 to afford a car, at least if you're following the standard budgeting advice, which says you shouldn't spend more than 10% of your monthly income on car-related expenses. That means more than 60% of American households cannot afford to buy a new car based on census data. And for individuals, the numbers are even worse because 82% of people make less than $100,000 a year. So if you're single and you're not a dual income household, 82% of people in that category cannot afford to buy a brand new car. And so this is why it starts to fall apart, guys, because we know, based on the census data, that the vast majority of American households do not make $100,000 a year. In fact, the median household income is about $75,000 a year, far below that number. And even if you do make that, your situation doesn't really improve much because think about it, guys. You know, you need to have roughly that amount too just to buy the median price home. In fact, it's more. You need to make more like $115,000 or $120,000 a year to technically be able to afford to buy the today's median price home. So think about it. If you make this kind of money and you want to buy a house this year, you want to go buy a brand new car, you're going to have the car payment. That's going to be seven, eight hundred dollars a month. You're going to have the house payment. That's going to be twenty eight hundred dollars a month. You're going to have the car insurance probably going to be through the roof. You're going to have, 
utilities, your groceries, all your other normal expenses that people have, next thing you know, all these expenses are eating up well over half of your monthly income. Just to be able to have a place to live and just be able to drive a car, that's it. I remember not that long ago, guys, like my goal, okay? Like my biggest goal in life was to make six figures a year, like to break past that $100,000 a year in income, you know? And that felt like back at the time when, when that was the goal, that once you make that, then you're gonna be set for life. You know, you're gonna be able to have a great middle class life and live happily ever after. But this recent run up in inflation has changed that dynamic forever, guys. Now you need to bump that number up by like 150 grand to have the same sort of quality of life, you know, if you wanna have all these things. And it's really shocking to me that in just like a four year time period, that this dynamic changed as much as it did because now you need to make 50% more money in order to have that same sort of dream lifestyle that you wanna have. It's kind of crazy. And in this story about the car troubles, uh, they talked to a bunch of different people to get their scenario and their situation of what's happening. They talked to uh, one person, she's a 62 year old single woman and she works from home, right? She makes $44,000 per year and that's gross, okay? That's not even take home pay and she can't buy a brand new car at all. Even a used car would be almost out of her budget right now. But back in 2005, that wasn't the case because in 2005, she bought a brand new Ford Focus, all right? But now it's starting to really rack up the miles. It's becoming less reliable. She doesn't have to drive that much, but every time she drives, she kind of has the anxiety that the car is gonna break down. And I know what that's all about. I, have that with my Camaro. The car's very unreliable. You never know when you're gonna get stuck. But she says, look, I have a credit score of 798 and my credit union is offering me a loan at 6.29% APR, which is twice my mortgage rate. And she says, do they think that the middle class can really afford that? I cannot. My fingers are bleeding as I struggle to hang on to the ledge of the lower middle class and not fall into the poverty line. They talk to uh, a couple and both him and his wife are teachers, okay? They barely make enough money to purchase a used car, let alone a brand new car. And he said, this year, you're gonna have to choose between buying a used car, a new shower, or an air conditioning unit. Since when does it take two salaries just to be able to afford an average used car? That's what this is coming to right now. So I keep thinking my logical brain is saying just like the housing market, when something that a lot of people need to buy becomes so expensive that only the elite few can afford it, how can the price of something like that remain that high indefinitely? Because just a few years ago, this is something that was accessible to a much higher percentage of the population, which could keep the sales rolling in for both houses and cars and everything. But now that say only 10, 15% of people out there make enough money just to be able to buy a new car and just be able to buy a house at today's prices, how are they gonna keep selling them? You know, a lot of people just use the same argument over and over for how this is gonna sustain. And they keep saying, it's the inventory, it's the inventory. Well, we're starting to see that dynamic change especially in the used car market, used car prices are coming down. And when it comes to real estate, guys, if you only have a small percentage of the population that can afford all of the houses for sale, that small percentage of the population is not gonna be able to absorb all that inventory in the long run. Maybe for a couple of years, maybe, maybe. But after that, a lot of these houses and listings are just gonna start piling up because people aren't gonna be able to buy them. So once again, I ask who's gonna buy them when the vast majority can't afford it, right? Even you could say, oh, the hedge funds and landlords are gonna buy it all up and rent it to you. Okay, well, if that's the case, let's think about this. They're gonna be paying all-time high prices for these homes to keep these home prices going, right? And they're gonna to wanna to return on that investment, which means they're gonna make the rent pretty high in these houses and people still won't be able to afford the rent. So I think their plan is pretty flawed if that's the case, right? Even if the hedge funds bought up all that inventory, right? They're not gonna be able to turn around and rent that house to you at a profit for the price they're paying for these homes. So even that strategy falls apart with today's prices, guys. But people are having all sorts of troubles with cars, not just uh, the cost of affording one, 
But even just like with theft and all of this, like there was a guy in Arizona and he's retired, 70 years old. He has a 2007 Toyota Prius and he had his catalytic converter cut off and stolen recently. And what happened was his insurance went up significantly because of it. Like that's not anything inside your control, right? You can't control if a thief shows up to your house or a parking lot or whatever and steals your catalytic converter, but yet this guy is being punished in the form of a much higher insurance premium because of it. So as if buying cars is already not bad enough when it comes to the expense and all of that, they're trying to get people with insurance now too. Any form possible. You're in an accident, insurance goes up. You make a claim for something stupid, insurance goes up. Your car is vandalized or stolen like this guy, your insurance goes up. Doesn't matter. Here's a woman that works two jobs, okay? She has a 2009 Hyundai Elantra, which was recently totaled in an accident, and she doesn't have the money to replace the car. And the big problem for her is she's required to go into the office three days a week because she was somebody who was remote for a while and now has to come back into the office for three days a week. And when this happens to you, what do you do? You don't have a way to come in. Are you gonna lose your job? You know, this is the, these are the situations that people are facing. Some people will call this gloom and doom and say, oh, Michael, you never have any good news. I call it reality, guys. People don't wanna hear that this is really happening, but it is. She says she has good credit, but she just doesn't have the money to cough up for another car payment anymore. She's worried if she's gonna be able to keep her job or not without owning a car. She's gonna to have to find ways to get a ride share or you know, ride the bus to work or something ridiculous just to be able to keep her job. And what a lot of people are doing is they're hanging on to used cars longer than ever, guys. In fact, over the past six years, the number of older cars on the road has been skyrocketing. In 2023, for passenger cars and light trucks, the average age for a vehicle on the road is about 12 and a half years, which is up by three years compared to 2022. So the average age of the vehicles out there are just getting older and older because people are trying to make them stretch until they're dead, essentially, because there's no other way to buy a new one right now. But you know, here's the interesting thing is like we talked about earlier, you really can't find a brand new car anymore for less than $30,000. They're, they're out there, but only 10% of all brand new cars are in that price category. So they're out there, but they're, they're few and far between, right? But manufacturers of cars are saying that, you know, because of all the disappointing sales numbers they've had from vehicles in that category, that's why they stopped making them. Because they're saying that uh, car buyers' preferences have shifted dramatically to larger trucks and SUVs in the last 10 years, and people also want you know, higher tech and more comfort amenities in the form of cameras and sensors and radars and large entertainment screens in the car, and all that stuff does add up. It does significantly increase the cost of the car, which makes sense of why these cars are getting more expensive. But the thing is, just because people want that stuff doesn't necessarily mean people can afford that stuff. However, when you buy a brand new car, chances are, I mean, you're somebody that has the income to buy that car unless you're just stretching to oblivion to afford something you really can't afford, which people do. But it does make sense from the point of view, like, okay, I want a brand new car, I want an SUV, I want it to have most of the bells and whistles, and I'm willing to pay for it. If that's where the manufacturers know they can sell people a brand new car, they're gonna make more of that and less of the other thing, right? I mean, even myself, I'm guilty of this too, guys. I have a brand new Jeep and I love it. In fact, I've always wanted to have an SUV since I first got my driver's license when I was 16. And for a lot of different reasons, I wasn't able to get one at the time. And now that I'm an adult, could finally afford to get a nicer car than what I had before, I decided to go with an SUV as well. And for me, you know, it's not just about having a bigger car. It's about the lifestyle that that car provides. Like you guys saw last year, I took it all the way to California and back, guys. I drove that thing cross country, no issues whatsoever, fantastic gas mileage. It only cost me like $500 in gas, you know, round trip to drive that thing 
from to and from Miami, guys. So it was a fantastic deal. So for me, it's about the lifestyle that having that SUV provides. If we had a small little car, we wouldn't be able to fit all our stuff in the car that needs to come with for a trip that we're staying away from home for three and a half months, you know? So having that Jeep provides us the ability to do something like that, which is really where it pays off for me having something like that is when you use it to its fullest potential you know people that go off-roading with trucks and different things like that if you use it for what it's really intended for then it can make sense for people that just want to drive it just to look cool or whatever obviously that's stupid what the side effect of this is though is that people who can't afford high-end suvs or trucks are left with very few good options especially in the brand new market you're looking at a much older used car in that case and of course this whole story about cars wouldn't be complete if we don't touch on evs basically the biden administration is trying to push everybody into owning an ev and clearly there's a political agenda here guys and i don't know why or what's really behind all of this i'm not even going to speculate on what but the reality is ever since the biden administration came into office they're trying to push people to buy an electric car in the form of the Inflation Reduction Act. They started giving people big tax credits for brand new EV cars, okay? And now they have a new tax credit for people to get a charging station put in their home up to $7,500 to pay for 30% of the cost to have something like that installed. So they're really, really pushing for people to get these EVs even though, you know, there's no evidence that they actually are cleaner for the environment. You know, they still take just as much energy and gas to produce and make and all the mining and stuff that has to be done. We've gone over this all in a full video a few weeks ago. And the vast majority of electricity that we produce in this country comes from gas and coal mines still. So everybody who's charging their car and thinking they're saving the world, they're just not, you know, their gas is burning somewhere in order to pump that electricity into your car. But that's besides the point, because the reality is EVs are still more expensive on average than buying a gas-powered car, and they're more expensive to operate. According to a, re a report from Self Credit Builder, they found out that average price to operate a EV for one year was about $4,856 compared to $4,107 for a gas-powered car, which includes your insurance, taxes, gas, charging, and maintenance. So basically the whole shebang of what it costs to own that car for a year still costs more with EVs than it does a gas-powered car. So. Just by looking at that data alone, I wouldn't be surprised if the government starts saying, hey, if you buy an EV car, you know, we'll reimburse you $3,000 per year just to drive it. And that'll, you know, make it cheaper to drive one, even though it's actually more expensive because it's being subsidized by the government. But once again, they're pushing for people to, to buy these and they have to give these incentives for people to even buy them, guys, because otherwise no one's buying it. Besides the Tesla Model Y, which is you know, one of the best selling cars in the country, the rest of the EV sales are plunging and you know, nobody's buying them. And you can't have an EV market where only people are buying one car. You know, that just doesn't work. But besides the cost of people buying these EVs, it's also causing trouble for the automakers that need to build them, okay? Because last year, there was the auto workers strike from the United Auto Workers, okay? They were on strike for six weeks against Ford, General Motors, and Stellantis. At different points throughout their negotiation with the UAW, they said they could not produce EVs at a large scale and remain competitive while paying higher wages. So the workers want to have higher wages and better benefits, obviously. But these EVs are so expensive for them to produce that they cannot sell them at a profit. So how does that business work, guys? How do you have the government come in and tell you you need to produce a product that you're not allowed to make a profit on because we're trying to hit these mandates. Like, how does that even make sense? That sounds communist to me. And obviously the dispute was settled and new labor contracts were formed, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna make the production of these vehicles more expensive and it's gonna cost these automakers billions of dollars, guys, with a B, all right? According to GM, the new contracts will increase the company's costs by $9.3 billion, which approximately adds up to $575 in cost per EV vehicle they make. 
So they're paying $575 for each one of these cars they produce, they're not making any money. So what kind of deal is that for a company like GM? I guess they're gonna have to sell a whole lot of gas-powered cars to make up for all the losses they're gonna have to be required to take on these EVs, right? That's what it sounds like to me. But they said some of these costs could be passed on to customers, so everything's gonna cost more, which is gonna make buying a car even more unaffordable, which we've been talking about this entire video. They can also offset costs by cutting staff, which means more layoffs at the companies in order to continue meeting these requirements of producing the EVs that the government wants them to make, guys. Like, what world are we living in? Is this still America right now? For Ford and Stellantis, it's the same thing. They said it's gonna increase their cost significantly, but they didn't even give a clear outline of how they're gonna handle it, but it's probably gonna be more the same. You're talking layoffs for people, job cuts, and higher vehicle prices for everybody. But here's the problem, guys. The earnings that people are making right now are essentially static. You know, people are not making enough money to keep up with the everyday rising cost of life right now. And when you throw in the rising cost of all the expenses people have to pay, plus the rising cost of buying a car and you just paying the rent or buying a home, you know, there's not a lot of happy endings out there. This is, it's kind of like, you know, a lot of people want to hear good news, but how is there good news right now? You know, there really isn't good news except for the select few people who can actually afford all this stuff, right? Then things are going pretty great, especially interest rates are high. You can earn a decent amount of money on your savings and all of this. And the stock markets hit an all-time high recently. Like for people that already have wealth and have real estate and have a decent amount of money invested in the markets and have money in savings accounts and can afford to buy brand new cars, I will admit, guys, this is a great time. This is a great economy for people like that. The problem is most people are not in that category. And honestly, in this video, I wanted to get into the latest uh, inflation data and all of this. I wasn't expecting to have this whole video be about cars. I wanted to get into a few more things like I usually do, but I'll save all that for another video later in the week. I just want people to realize the cost of things that everybody used to be able to buy for the most part. Like my first car, guys, I think I paid like $6,500 or $7,000, something like that. It was a 2002 Pontiac Grand Am and it only had like 14,000 miles on it. So it wasn't brand new, but it was a very pristine used car. Okay, and that was a used car for $7,000. And at the time I got that car, it was only like two years old. I got it in 2004, maybe 2005. And unfortunately the car got totaled, but it was a fantastic car. It never gave me any trouble. And I used it to deliver pizzas, which is one of my favorite jobs I ever had when I was still working regular jobs. And that opportunity is gone. Like we're, you're not gonna find a used car today for $7,000 in pristine condition. That's almost like a brand new car with low miles like that. Those days are gone forever. And somebody like me, a teenager back then, could afford to buy this car and make the payment working a teenager pizza delivery job, okay? That's how much the economy has changed. So it's not like I'm just saying all of this, you know, with no reference points, guys. Like I'm old enough to have gone through the so-called good times when things were so much easier than right now. And it is getting way too hard out there. There's just no way most people are gonna be able to keep up with this, which is my continuing thesis of why I believe this economy is going to come to a crashing end sooner than later. Because we cannot have an economy that only works for the top 10, 15% of people and everybody else is suffering, you know? It's not gonna last long term. Maybe they can kick the can down the road a couple more years, past the election and all of this, but it ain't gonna last. So if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. And if you don't wanna wait for my next video to come out, check out this one on the screen right over here. And I'll see you in the next one.